Greetings sailors and welcome to my first look at HMS Nelson and uh, <clears throat> yeah that's maybe not quite the right picture. There we go, that's the proper actual HMS Nelson. No idea how that uh, first picture got there, caption guy must have put it there, yes. Anyway, so HMS Nelson, it's going to be the second free XP premium to be added to the game and I decided to concentrate on this particularly because whilst the regular branch battleships are still somewhat in flux while they're being uh, uh, tested and finalised, HMS Nelson's stats are finalised. It has been confirmed multiple times at this point that this is the release date of the ship. So what we have is a tier 7 British premium battleship and the main reason it's going to be a premium and there's going to be a free xp ship is that wargaming just couldn't really make it fit with the main branch at all and the gun progression in the main in the main branch is already a little bit wonky because you've got tier 5 12 inches you get uh, 15 inch at uh, tier 6 then you get 14 inch at tier 7 and then at tier 8 you go back to the 15 inch guns so it's already a bit wonky and they didn't want to throw in an extra bit of wonkiness by having uh, Nelson be at uh, tier 7 as it would probably have had to have been with 16 inch guns and then going to 14 inch guns with KGV at tier 8 and they felt that 14 inch guns really wouldn't have worked at tier 8 unless they gave them some really wacky buffs. So you can kind of see where Wargaming's coming from from having not put this in the regular branch and it is different it looks very different it's got that all forward gun configuration which we do have in the game already and you know a couple of real life other battleships used it um, primarily the french i believe but it was also considered for the yamato designs and uh, one of those preliminary designs is in game as the the t9 japanese the izumo and that was actually heavily influenced by the nelson designs now they were um, different because they were built under the limitations of the Washington Naval Treaty. Uh, other nations already had some 16 inch gunned battleships and uh, as far as I can tell the Royal Navy was like we're going to have some of those as well and so there was this highly unusual design which for the time was actually fairly well armoured and um, they basically did it to, uh, they had this configuration to fit it in the uh, displacement constraints for building new battleships. So consequently this is the only 16 inch gun, uh, well this and the, the Rodney are the only 16 inch gun battleships that ever served in the Royal Navy and the only ships that were are going to have battle uh, bigger guns uh, i said battle guns there i mean they're all battle guns <laughs> that makes sense um were um oh i can't even remember the name of it now but it, it was a battle cruiser that was going to have 18 inch guns and uh, it was actually then converted to an aircraft carrier so it never actually saw service with 18 inch guns so far as i'm aware so it's a bit of an oddity is what i'm getting at and in warships terms it's it's all right. We've already got, of course, a tier seven premium for the British in the shape of HMS Hood. Uh, as I said, we've already got similar looking ships in terms of the Dunkirk and the Izumo, but this doesn't particularly play like any of them, I would say. Maybe more like the Dunkirk in terms of, um, the armor's all right, but it's not that good. And it does have a raised citadel. I mean, we'll, we'll cover the armor in a bit more detail at the end, but, uh, this is not a ship where you want to be pulling broadsides. In the Izumo you can kind of get away with it because the armour in the Izumo is actually pretty good. But in this uh, you can just get deleted and I did have once or twice when I got caught in the middle of a turn. Uh, I just got annihilated by uh, I think once New Mexico, I think once was it a tier 5 battleship or it might have been another tier 6. I don't know, it was something with a lot of lower calibre guns basically and I just got nuked because it's got that raised citadel. So like the Dunkirk, like the Izumo, um, you've got to be careful about choosing when and how you want to commit to pushing forwards. It's strong in a push, it's very good in a push, but if it goes wrong or if you have to fall back from the enemy, then things suddenly get a lot more awkward. And that's true with the Izumo, that's true with the, the Dunkirk, but the, the Dunkirk has speed to get away that this doesn't, and the Izumo has armour to take the damage that this doesn't. But this gets a trick that they don't, 
this gets a very special heal. Now, I'll actually mention that right now. I haven't even started on the stats yet, but the heal is... Um, it's good! Most of the Tier 7 battleships, it's um, something like between 300 and 350-ish hit points per second that you can get back. Colorado might be over the 350 mark. I'd, I'd have to double check that, but you know, Colorado's is pretty good for tier 7. Hood doesn't get a special heal. Uh, this, however, without the India Delta flag, which gives you, I think, plus 20%, is it? Something like that. It's 1188 hit points per second. With the India Delta flag, it's 1425 hit points per second. It's nuts. You can heal a lot. So basically, you want people to fire HE at you, you want to take that IFE HE damage, you don't particularly want to take Citadel damage or Torpedo damage because uh, you will be able to get less of that back of course, but um, yeah, fire damage is good, fire damage is excellent, you just get spammed with all, like, all the HE, you let the fires burn and you press the T button and all your health comes back and it's like magic. And that kind of helps overcome the fact that otherwise it's not that tough of a ship. Because like the other tier 7 battleships, it's got 25 um, bow and 25 stern armor, which can be overmatched by 15 inch and above guns. And the nature of the citadel means that it's entirely possible to get citadel from the front or the back. It's less dangerous than showing a broadside, but it means that even with proper angling, you can still get citadel. So in some senses, this is quite a squashy ship, but uh, it's also, it's a big blubbery ship if that makes any sense it, it's it's it, it's got that capacity to absorb a lot of damage not because of the armor but because of that incredible heal so we've got four replays in this uh, particular uh, first look video i might have gone a little bit overboard but i've been kind of enjoying playing this overall compared to the hood the guns just feel so much nicer to use even if it's a much slower ship and the hood's armor is unquestionably better uh, but overall i've i've preferred this i even think it looks quite nice but i'm a bit weird now we do have there's one more thing i want to finish i've got this whole list of things in my head um Famously, there's this nickname of, of Nelsol, and uh, Rodney was nicknamed Rodnol. Um, I'll flash up on the screen why that is. Uh, you'll have a little picture, maybe you'll be able to spot the resemblance. Uh, but there were a class of uh, Royal Navy um, oilers, you know, fleet tankers, uh, that were called the OL class, and they all had names that started with OL. So I think one of them was Olwyn, there was an Oleander. I'm trying to think what the rest were. I don't know, there was like half a dozen of them, they all started with OL, and the hull shape vaguely resembles that of the Nelson, and so, yes, that's that's how that nickname came about. Confusingly, there was also a later class of, of OL tankers built for the RFA in uh, the 1960s, because the Royal Navy does just like to use the same names over and over again, because... You may not be aware, but not only was there a Nelson class battleship, there was also a, a, a Lord Nelson class battleship. What was it, Admiral Nelson class battleship? No, I think, I'm pretty sure it was the Lord Nelson class. And uh, we actually have in game at the moment three different variations of town class ships because we've had two lots of town class, uh, town class cruisers. I think the tier, is it tier three? The Weymouth, or is that the tier two? I don't know. That's a town class cruiser. Edinburgh and Belfast are both town class cruisers and then HMS Campbelltown is actually a town class destroyer because the land lease destroyers from the US were designated town class ships even though they were of various different types. Not confusing at all. So on to the stats. I won't be talking about the KGV, although, I mean, you know, it's not like it, it, the ND, uh, the NDA, N, NDA, yes, there we go. I was trying to think what the word was there, or what the acronym, um, I wanted to say the NVA, but that's a different thing, and it's because it's the King George the V, King George V, uh, yes, well done, Brain. Um, those stats aren't finalised yet, I might mention it in general terms, but I will be comparing it to uh, the rest of the Tier 7 battleships. So, you've got 59,400 hit points, which is okay. Um, it's about what the Germans have, or well, I say the Germans, but what the Gneisenau has. It's actually a little more than the Gneisenau. And overall, that's, that's pretty good for its tier. I mean, Nagato is 
way over everybody else and Hood's got a, a, a walking, a walking, that's, that's another good word, that's totally a word, a walking great big wad of hit points at 67,000. So, you know, 59,000 is, is all right, um, but you're going to be in a, a, a match where you're taking the focus, going through those hit points potentially um, quite quickly and then healing them back quite quickly if all is going according to plan. We've got 19% uh, torpedo bulge, um, so you get not quite uh, as good uh, uh, torpedo damage reduction as, as basically most of the other battleships, but none of the tier 7s are particularly great apart from Colorado. Colorado is the only one that has uh, any great shakes in that department. Armor-wise, um, it's actually got some pretty tanky belt armor if you are angling against stuff that cannot overmatch you. Uh, the, the the belt is 406 millimeters, I believe, so it's actually pretty tough. You will bounce a fair bit, which is rather nice. But if you're facing 15 inch and above guns, some of those shells might just overmatch, and then they might just find your citadel, and that's not so nice. The guns are 16 inch, as I've mentioned. It's got uh, a 3x3 arrangement, and unlike the Izumo, it has a forward-facing third turret, so you don't have to wait for it to come all the way around. And the angles are actually rather decent as well, although you have to sometimes resist the temptation to angle out to use that third turret, because you can end up exposing just a bit too much of your side. And so... Uh, it, it can it can seem like a good idea to try and get that third turret round to get those shots off and then you end up regretting it. So that's more a case of judging what's firing at you at any one time. I, I was using the Jack Dunkirk captain for um, the playtesting for this and I did have, uh, I do have the, um, the, um, the skill, I can't remember what it's called, the one that tells you how many people are targeting you, which is, that's just handy um, in... Um, any ship really but I think the Nelson particularly because you need to judge sometimes when to maneuver when to, to make your turn and if you see that there's maybe only one ship targeting you and uh, you know they've fired or if it's a cruiser or something like that then at that point you might feel a lot more confident so you've got 30 second reload which is pretty standard uh, turret traverse 45 seconds not particularly fast but I mean it's not super slow uh colorado and nagato basically have the same this is one of the, the areas where the hood definitely beats it with 36 seconds but the hood has one of the better turret traverse uh rates at tier 7 it's uh pretty whippy in that regard the range is very comfortable uh 19 no it's not that's the nice now 18.2 which is actually fine you know uh, for a tier 7 battleship um just over 18 kilometers is absolutely like that's that's okay that's workable you don't you don't particularly uh, suffer in that regard all of the tier 7 battleships have actually got a pretty good range come to think of it um it's not far off being the worst for tier 8 but that doesn't really mean anything in the context of you know it's still 18 kilometers plus um, it looks like the kgv will have the worst but it's only going to be worse by a little bit Dispersion and uh, the Sigma. The Sigma I've heard is, is 1.9, which is actually um, like the, the average for most battleships. The, the standard value is, is 1.8, uh, which is what Hood gets. Um, 1.9 therefore means that your shells will go where you want them to more often, and the actual uh, the horizontal dispersion is, is not too bad either, considering the, the range that you've got. It seems to be better than the Germans certainly overall i found these guns very pleasant to use in terms of i mean sometimes they'll troll you because they're battleship guns but uh, when they hit home they hit home reasonably well now there are some peculiarities with the actual shells though i'll read out off the values first but um there's one thing you might notice throughout all these replays i don't really get a lot of citadels against battleships citadels against cruisers that's fine citadels, citadels against battleships not so much, but I'm still getting plenty of regular penetrations. Now the actual shell values, well they're 16 inch guns, um, it's 12,000 exactly for the AP and 6,900 
for the HE. Uh, compared to the other 16 inch gunned ships, um, that's the worst AP, but the best HE. It's also got the best fire chance at its tier, a whopping 46%. And you'll notice in some of these replays, I use more HE than you'd think I would. The AP doesn't have a great penetration value. The uh, shell arm time of the AP is actually, I think, the same as the hood as well. I think the standard is 0.3 seconds and it's 0.15 for uh, these two ships. It might also be that for the, for the King George V. I'm not entirely certain. But what that means is that the shell will arm and detonate inside the ship quicker, which is good for cruisers, but makes getting uh, citadels on battleships a lot harder. So you'll get more of those regular penetrations. But honestly, unlike Hood with its 1.8 Sigma and also not very good penetration for those 15 inch guns, um, these are just so much nicer to use. However, it's a little unfair on the cruiser players, I have to say that because with that better Sigma and with that better chance of, of getting Citadels because of that arm time, um, yeah, it did feel a little unfair at times. Uh, not as unfair as maybe some of the higher tier British battleships, but uh, there were times when I just was blatting cruisers left, right and centre. And it's down to that that shell arm time and you would really almost want it to be the other way around for battleships to be more effective against battleships for knocking off high numbers of hit points against other battleships um, rather than be able to delete cruisers all at once but that's not how it works with the hood and that that's maybe more just an inherent flaw with how wargaming treats um, the, the, the classes firing against each other generally I almost feel like, although it's probably not realistic in any way, shape or form, that, that battleship uh, players doing citadels against cruisers should should get less damage, like there should be a, an additional modifier there, so they get the full value of the, of the citadel against another battleship, but they do less damage with the citadel against a cruiser, and you could still easily delete a cruiser even so, but uh, it, I don't know, it, it's, it's just a bit too easy to punish cruisers really hard all at once. And that's certainly true with the Nelson. I, I found that, like, multiple times, just deleting cruisers when the RNG lines the shots up right, which it will more often with that 1.9 Sigma. With Hood, you would think it'd be the same, but um, Hood, Hood isn't great. Hood feels like you're using 11-inch guns rather than 15-inch uh, guns. And one of the things they could do with the Hood is actually buff the HE chance, uh, the HE fire chance, because... Uh, I mentioned this in the, the preliminary gameplay video I did, just the very first game in the in the Nelson, uh, that um, there are often times in the hood where you feel like you have to fire HE because you know that the, the AP penetration isn't sufficient, and even though it's 15 inch AP, your accuracy isn't really going to be sufficient either to, you know, maybe overmatch a, a bit of bow armor or whatever. Uh, there are times when I, I think um, uh, the hood, you know, should maybe have a faster reload or I don't know but but I think better HE fire chance would actually be really beneficial to the hood because you have to reach for the HE sometimes and 34% uh, on the hood it's not that good whereas 46% on the Nelson yeah they're they're an inch bigger shells but uh the Royal Navy battleships generally otherwise seem to have really good HE fire chance so that that would be a a moderate buff for the hood which would actually you know improve its utility a bit the velocity of the shells uh, is uh eight uh not, not eight anything seven eight eight so um that's both for the ap and the he they're rather slow shells and they have rather a a, a curving trajectory as well you can see they they have quite a they, 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 they come down from from quite a high arc comparatively speaking it's not quite you know cleveland six inch guns or uh or uh uh, American destroyer guns but it is good for the plunging hits and that's that's another thing this has going over the hood I don't think the hood has those uh, shell arcs at all so um, you're not going to get the plunging deck hits and because these are 16 inch guns even though the AP is behind that of the other 16 inch guns at its tier uh, you can still get those uh, overmatch pens 
and for a lot of ships at uh, well the tier 7 battleships anyway they don't have enough deck armor to resist being overmatched by 16 inch guns if you have those plunging hits so you might actually find you have more success with with plunging citadels than, than broadside citadels but um, just generally speaking, I was getting way more citadels against uh, cruisers anyway, which I guess is, is mostly true for battleships generally. But I was getting plenty of, of salvos like that, you know, 10k, 15k salvos without any citadels, which normally with a battleship, um, you would you would need a citadel to be at least part of that, that damage. But uh, yeah, overall, the guns are pretty good. In terms of the secondaries, You've got a mix of uh, half a dozen 120 mil HE throwers, and you've also got some six inch AP throwers with a range of uh, five kilometers for both. So nothing special, really. Uh, five is pretty damn standard for tier seven. The Germans get a little bit over that. So you can, you know, take AFT and whatever, but um, the secondaries aren't overall a particular strength of this ship. It, it's not like the Germans or, say, you know, the War Spite, where you can actually buff the secondaries out quite a lot. It's nice to have them. Occasionally they come in useful, and the positioning is actually quite good on them. They are across the beam of the ship, according to some people in the comments of the last video. Um, so you've got at least a couple that can that, that can fire forwards. Um, but, um, yeah, they're, they're nothing special, but, you know, they, they came in handy on occasion. There is a downside with them, though, that um, they don't count as dual-purpose guns, I believe. I don't think any of them are dual-purpose guns. So your uh, AA rating, which is what we're coming on to next, is principally, you know, unlike say the, the Germans or the Colorado where you can take manual AA and actually get quite a benefit out of that. Your AA is principally um, comprised of much smaller calibers. In fact, with most of the British battleships, your, mo your main AA strength is in the, uh, the 40 mil Bofors emplacements, which are fairly numerous, which is, you know, it's good. Um, the, the, the DPS rating on this, for instance, at a range of two kilometers, so that's with everything you've got is 281 which is actually that's pretty decent for this tier but because they are those um those 40 mil emplacements most of them don't have a lot of range uh, on most of the british battleships i think it's like 3.5 kilometers but on nelson it's 2.5 and uh, they're also quite easily knocked out there's one of the later replays um i said that you know on the second of, of four now uh where i think I think all my mid-range AA got knocked out, so I, I think I lost every single 40 mil emplacement to HE spam. So they don't they don't have a lot of hit points as secondary modules. They will get knocked out. And that was a frontal citadel. Yes, that was not nice. So yeah, the AA power is uh, maybe going to shoot down a few planes, but it's it's not as buffable as the the Germans. It's definitely not as buffable, and it is easily knocked out so over the course of a long battle you are going to become significantly more vulnerable nobody's going to be worried about dropping torpedo bombers on you particularly dive bombers you might have more of an effect against and uh, hello mr congo yeah even at this range no citadel but i'm also about to give him a little friendly boop just because this team was fairly terrible so you know i was just playing for damage at that point and why the hell not so um, yeah, what was I saying about the AA? Yeah, so you could you could try for an AA spec. You could you could take the uh, the module that gives you better AA range, and you could take AFT, and you could probably get the distance on those out to like what would that be? Three point something kilometers for your main AA envelope, but um, it, it's not going to seriously dissuade anybody from from coming after you. Speed wise. This is not a fast ship particularly. 24 knots is obviously better than the Colorado's 21 knots, and it's only a knot behind what the Nagato has, but it's not fast. It's it's not fast by any stretch of the imagination, and even with the... Um, I forget the name of the flag now. 
the one that's got a salt eye in it that makes you go faster that one uh you only get something like 0.7 or 0.8 extra um speed out of that uh, um, you know 0.8 of the knots extra speed out of that so it, it's no speed demon and it does suffer from that colorado problem of sometimes if you get out of position there are plenty of battleships that you can meet basically everything that isn't american that will overtake you and it means almost all cruisers will overtake you and all destroyers will definitely overtake you so it makes having to withdraw to retreat problematic and I'll say this for the Dunkirk, at least it can make a fast getaway. But Nelson has another quality going for it that kind of doesn't completely nullify that, but it does help. But uh, yeah, some people will just find the speed um, annoying and sometimes that speed means you'll get out of place. It might even be you get out of place in a, in a game where you're winning and then you're just struggling to catch up because the enemy team's running away. You know, you might actually be in the position you want to be on the offensive, but they're all running away faster than you can catch up to them. But, you know, the range is not terrible. As long as they stay spotted, you'll still be able to hit them with your guns. Turning radius is 750 meters, which is actually uh, pretty decent. It's, it's not anything like the Colorado has, of course, but um, it's enough to make it feel fairly maneuverable. It does pull around in a reasonably tight circle. It's not going to torpedo beat like the Colorado or even the War Spike, but I did have a moderate amount of success dodging torpedoes that I knew were incoming. It's also got a rudder response of 14.9 seconds, which um, is, is less good, but it's still not terrible. And as a rule of thumb, I take the rudder shift uh, module, uh, there we go, a rare, uh, Citadel strike on a, a, another battleship, but it was a, a Fuso, which is not known for its armor. Uh, I, I generally take the rudder shift module on battleships anyway, so with it, it was down to what was it, 12 point something, 13 point something, I can't remember offhand. So, um, yeah, it, it's not a bad combination. It will not um, be able to, to turn in as, as nimbly as uh, as... A, you know a, a select handful of ships but it, it still is considerably better than most and if you've played the hood at all with its 910 meter turning circle trying to dodge stuff in the hood can be a bit of a nightmare and uh the hood's not very good torpedo bulge protection also becomes a serious liability at that point because uh good luck actually dodging anything but uh, no it, it felt maneuverable enough and some people might not like the speed, but overall, um, I didn't really feel it was a, ser a serious hindrance. Lastly, for the stats, we come on to probably your greatest asset overall. And it's an asset that all of the Royal Navy battleships, barring the hood, get to enjoy. Uh, because, um, well, I've said that, does War Spite, actually? Let's quickly check that. What is the uh, concealment on the war spite? Um, it's not bad for its tier, so it kind of holds true for the war spite. Anyway, uh, but yes, it has a very good surface concealment. And were the King George V not in the mix, it would actually have the best surface concealment at tier 7. But the King George V will be better. Without camo, which why would you be playing with it without camo? I don't know. But anyway, without camo, it's 15.3. With the the standard premium camo that you get, it's 14.8. On Jack Dunkirk, I've also got the, uh, the Concealment Expert skill. So that then brings it down to a further uh, level of 12.7. Although I think it's actually 12.8, but... It's somewhere between 12.7 and 12.8 because the World of Warships client only displays things in uh, single decimal places. So we'll go with 12.8 as a rule of thumb. 12.7 is what's in my spreadsheet, but that's, you know, been done with formulas and things. So 12.7 is pretty sneaky, and that's without the benefit of uh, a concealment module, of course. Um, so because it's, what, 20 seconds to, to stealth up again? Um, there are a great many occasions, if you're keeping at medium ranges, where you will stealth up between firing, because your reload is 30 seconds, and that affords you an extra opportunity to manoeuvre your ship. 
and that level of stealth also comes in very useful when you're trying to disengage although as i've said things will eventually catch up with you um, but it also it, it's incredibly useful you might be quite close and needing to pull a turn and uh in another ship in say the dunkirk um by the time you've stealthed you've got to get really far away from the enemy uh, but that would require turning in the first place so you know sometimes in the dunkirk you just get committed you have to push because if you turn broadside you'll get annihilated there are times in the nelson where if you pull broadside you get annihilated but you can get unspotted in the nelson i do highly recommend concealment expert on this as a as a captain skill or with whatever captain you're using in this particular ship because um about ability to be unspotted to maneuver to pull a turn when you need to is incredibly useful and it will keep you alive so much longer because that's one of the big downsides of the dunkirk is it, it it cannot be sneaky it's not a sneaky ship and it's also a squashy ship which is not a good combination it requires you really being on your toes whereas with the nelson you can just stealth up again I can't really overemphasize how useful this is as a survivability skill. Not getting shot will keep you alive for quite a long time. It also allows you to get up close and be the unexpected battleship in somebody's face. Maybe they don't expect there to be a battleship to decloak, you know, at just about 13 kilometers in front of them, but surprise, there you are. You can also do this in American battleships, of course. And um, especially from tier 8 upwards, the American battleships can also be very sneaky. Um, but for uh, tier 7, Colorado is not sneaky at all. The Colorado can get down to a best value of 13.9. 13.9 is still not bad for a battleship, but 12.8 is a hell of a lot better. And uh, like I say, if not for the KGV, it would be the best at tier 7. Although... Um, it's not like the KGV beats it by a huge amount, but it's enough to to be even sneakier still if the stat that I'm looking at holds true. So that's it for the stats just about. I mean, I've covered the heal. Uh, you don't get anything else really. It's just the heal and the damage control party. Uh, so yeah, a lot of the playstyle of this ship revolves around um, being sneaky to make your uh, maneuvers and then just opening up and blapping people unexpectedly if you can. It's also quite an effective damage soak as I've intimated but you can still lose a lot of health very quickly and it is a real downside with the the armor layer on the ship that you can get citadel through the front or the rear so easily and uh, heck even the deck armor isn't very good. One of the things Hood does have over this is it's got I think 32 mil of deck armor. This only has 25 and it's quite a wide expense of deck. So you're going to take quite a bit of IFHE damage which as I've said is not such an issue as you can repair it back but it also means any plunging hits could also um, with, with battleship caliber shells with 15 inch or above shells could be very nasty. So you, you can take the damage but you've got to be careful about what you're taking the damage from. In this particular match, as you could see, um, now I can actually start talking about some gameplay. Um, I was being a bit cautious to begin with, and now we've reached a stage of the battle where it's only a couple of ships left on each side. It's quite close, and we need to start trying to take control of this middle cap. But I'm getting rather a lot of attention, as you can see. And I've also got this hipper who seems to terminally not being paying uh, paying attention to what's going on around them. I actually, I think, saved that hipper from taking an extra torpedo by pushing into them as I did, because I was already starting to turn when those torpedoes were, uh, when the torpedo bombers were coming towards us. The hipper only started to turn, as far as I can tell, when they were being dropped in the water. And if I hadn't rammed into them and uh, helped push them round, I think they'd have taken two rather than just that one. So... <laughs> Yeah, it might seem like I was being uh, the careless battleship driver, but actually I was uh, doing the whole get down, Mr. President thing. Not, well, not, not intentionally, but that's how it worked out. So of the ships I'm facing, I mean, it's a pair of Germans, which is not great, but I've got those magic HE shells. If you can land more than a couple, it's 
fairly well guaranteed that you'll get a fire. I mean, broadside against the Gneisenau, now, okay, yes, AP would have been better there, even if I wouldn't have gotten uh, a, a Citadel out of it necessarily. But um, the ability to just set fires on even heavily angled battleships. I mean, having said what I've said, the, the AP is almost a bit perverse in that it feels way more effective at punishing battleships, uh, uh, punishing cruisers rather, than punishing battleships that are playing badly. Um, you've got the HE, which is just such a, a powerful um, tool to use against battleships that otherwise you would struggle with. 46% fire chance is, is kind of nuts. That might be one of the highest fire chances in the game. Although actually, no, no, I'm going to stand by that. One of the highest, not the highest. Some of the high tier British battleships will have higher, but not by uh, that much. Not by a, a, a huger margin, if that makes any sense. Yay, there's another ass citadel. So, yeah, the HE, don't discount the HE. You're going to have to, to think about when you want to use it, but less so than with the, the King George V with its 14 inch guns, which you almost have to treat like a, a Scharnhorst where you um, are really going to be switching back and forth between HE and AP on a, on a very regu uh, regular basis even uh, to ensure that you can actually uh, do damage against people. Whereas with this ship, um, the 16 inch AP, you know, as long as you've not got a highly angled battleship to contend with and you don't feel uh, confident to try and uh, go through bow armor or whatever, um, yeah, the, the, the guns just feel so much nicer to use than the guns on the hood do. And they actually, I would say, feel nicer than the guns on, say, the Gneisen Owl and maybe even the Nagato. Colorado's got pretty nice guns, though. I will give Colorado that. You know, a lot of people don't like how slow it is and how inflexible that can make it, but the guns on the Colorado are fairly damn nice. And these are nice guns as well, even with that that lack of penetration, which is actually uh, fairly historical. You know, these are the the biggest guns that served on a uh, that, that were used on a on a battleship, because technically the 18-inch guns were on a battle cruiser. But uh, uh, you don't you don't really feel like having less penetration um, is a bad thing, because because they weren't great guns in real life. And I think that was largely down to the ammunition that they used. I'm very vaguely remembering this stuff. You know, if you want the history and all that, go watch Jingles' this video. <laughs> but uh, um, it, it's not like you have. It, it's not like German battleship velocities. Uh, having lighter ammunition doesn't particularly give you fast shells. You are going to have to learn to lead with these. But if you've played any of the other 16-inch gun battleships, then you're going to be used to that anyway. So we've come down to just, you know, a couple of ships versus a couple of ships. They do still have a carrier in play as well, which was my big concern, actually. But um, the carrier wasn't really that much of a threat, as it turned out. This New Orleans, however, apparently I just shot through his bow somehow. And then out of four hits, at very close range, I had one actual penetration, one that must have penned the torpedo belt, or like a gun emplacement or something, and two bounces. So that was a bit, that was a bit RNG right there. I, that's, that first group of three that somehow shot through the bow, I still don't know if that was something to do with the ping, or if they impacted the water just ahead of the bow, but somehow the splashes came up on the other side of the bow. I don't know, it was a very, very odd group of shells. But um, yeah, despite singularly failing to sink that, uh, that New Orleans, which I would have expected to do uh, with really anything else, uh, I, I survived that. My uh, teammates took out the New Orleans, which was what I was counting on them to do. But that Gneisen now remains alive. However, we're still ahead on points. We're now actually starting to cap A. And even though this Arizona is going to get reset, it means that they're not getting any points from it. So despite my death, despite losing a battleship's worth of hit points, we're still going to win. This was a very close game. Very, very close. And it ended up um, like, even though at, at the end the teamwork wasn't all it could be, uh, it, it was still... It was still one where we just squeaked in and um, managed quite a, a, a nice victory. 
and uh, it, it ended up being a fairly decent result for the Nelson as well. And unlike with the Hood, where I feel, and, and I've said this in, in the previous videos I've done on the, in the Hood, where you, it, it's very good at, at, at getting a certain amount of damage over and over again. You can get kind of, what, 60, 70, 80k damage very consistently. Nelson, I was comfortably getting 100k damage games without too much effort and i think it's definitely capable of a lot more i mean there was that the previous replay where i had 155 but part of that at least came from ramming that congo at the end and, and quite a bit of that damage was done when the game was already lost because we we basically lost that game very early on because so many of, of the team died very early on um, but um yeah, I feel like there is the potential that you could walk away with a very good damage game in the Nelson if you played it enough. So on to the last game. And this is actually going to be the lowest damage replay, but also um, it's going to have a nice bit of teamwork. I decided to end on this one. And part of the reason why I had four entire replays in this, uh, in this video is just indecisiveness, basically. <laughs> I couldn't quite choose which of the replays to, to use. I mean, generally the first replay or two in these first look videos, I know I'm going to be yammering on about the stats anyway, so I don't choose anything too special. But I like to have at least one game where there's something a bit interesting going on. That previous one, it was just, it was a very, very close game. And it maybe um, illustrated that, that this is a good ship in a push. But this this is going to be much more of an awkward situation in this particular match. And I think in part I'm going to get away with it because I'm only going to be facing um, really one battleship in particular on this flank, the, uh, the, the, the enemy Colorado, which I know I have to be wary of because he can pen me. But it's also going to demonstrate as well um, the value of the, uh, the stealth on the Nelson because um, there are a lot of times in this match where being able to stealth up again to uh, change my angle even, you know, uh, just reposition slightly, it is going to actually be quite useful. So I'm actually heading away from the enemy but keeping an angle at the moment. And um, there are a lot of times when you're going to have to, to do this because you can't sail broadside obviously you don't want to do that uh, so if you maintain sufficient angle that then you can swing the back of the ship or the front of the ship as need be around and uh, actually um, uh, throw off enemy shots that that's going to be very very useful I end up doing that a, a fair bit in this particular one and um, it's it's probably more the fact that I was facing a lot of cruisers on this side that, that really ultimately ended up um, being good for me because um, there weren't really... Uh, there's one destroyer but he's not particularly being bold in terms of keeping me lit up and so it's only when I'm firing that I'm getting lit up. So I, I, I have control of when I want to stealth and unstealth. And also um, the, the battleships on this side. I mean the Warspite's guns actually are... are uh, fairly dangerous as well, but this war spy is just sailing along broadside. So, even though I'm not getting any citadels here, I'm still knocking huge chunks out of this player. So, uh, it, it's really only the Colorado I'm going to end up having to worry about. This was not a particularly battleship heavy match. And even though uh, there's a Kaga on the enemy team, um, it's going to turn out the enemy Kaga player wasn't that good either, but we'll see more on them later. There's actually a rare thing where we've got a ranger player but they didn't suck so that right there makes this replay somewhat noteworthy so the Buscovitas popped up on the other side unexpectedly and uh, that's not great news he can just about stealth drop and uh, that's what he's been doing to the New Mexico it's also Charles Martel here the uh, Fiji and the rangers on this side as well so if the rangers using their planes on this side they'll have a quick turnaround but at the moment the rangers concentrating their planes on the other side it is a a, a balanced setup ranger so it's it's one squad of uh, each kind of plane which is probably i mean the ranger has a reputation for not being great but of the ranger loadouts um you know if you can learn to make do with that and you're good at doing things like your manual strafes and your manual drops 
then that's probably the most useful one. But um, if you want to take an offensive, you know, strike only loadout, then uh, you kind of have to nobble the enemy carrier first because otherwise they're going to just walk all over you. So that was um, possibly a citadel, a bit painful. And uh, it wasn't even that I was that badly angled. It's just, I think, you know, unless it's going to clip the belt, it's, it's got a good chance of penning, and, and that obviously did pen. But right now I'm more concerned with trying to take out this, uh, this Whiskavita, who's uh, been uh, fairly instrumental in killing the, uh, the, the, the new mechs, because I really can't outrun a Whiskavita. It's a fast little ship and he's got some cruisers coming down that side as well so if I need to fall back that's going to be a bit of a problem because uh, the Briscovita you know if I'm falling away from the Briscovita it's gonna make it really tough for them to drop torps on me but it also makes it very awkward for me in terms of actually then trying to hit back at anything and uh, potentially avoid damage from the Colorado but it just obviously depends on what the Colorado is firing at at the moment though everything seems to be focusing the Martel, and the Fiji's buggered off to the middle to deal with um, whatever other enemy destroyer that is that, that was on this side and then went through that uh, gap between the two middle islands. So they are pressing us a bit at the moment, but this isn't so bad. Overall though, we're down on ships, we're down on points. And as this is a standard game, uh, it's all a little bit awkward because standard games generally are. So, ideally we do want to try and win this flag. So the Rangers now sent some planes over this side, which is, if nothing else, very useful for air spotting that Briscovita, who's now just about in torque dropping range. But if he tried to drop, he'd be dropping on a ship that's travelling away from it. But uh, at least I know where they are now. And so that's forced them to smoke up, that's forced them to be static for a bit. Because they've smoked up, now I'm not spotted anymore. So I can start to bring my ship around, I can manoeuvre a bit, I can see what my opportunities are and uh, decide that I want to try and black the Chapayev. Because uh, I think the Chapayev, over a sustained amount of time with the 6-inch guns, especially if they've got IFHE, could do quite a bit of damage. The Pensacola, on the other hand, um, they could still set fires, but they're not going to do as much damage with their actual HE shells. But even so, if I gave broadside to a Pensacola and they whacked some AP into me, that, that could be very nasty. I was actually half expecting that in that last game when the uh, the New Orleans pulled past me. I was thinking, right, I'm just going to get a bunch of 8-inch uh, AP in the side, aren't I? But I think at that range, you really only have to worry about battleships. I think an 8-inch AP cruiser would be somewhat hard-pressed to actually pen your belt because the belt does protect the uh, the uh, the citadel, at least from the sides. So the Colorado seems to be being very shy. I mean, I know the Colorado is a slow ship, but they were last spotted heading over to the 10 line. So it's really only these cruisers. So I've decided to actually turn back because our carrier blind dropped the Buscovitsa in the smoke, which is incredibly useful. That was the main threat for me. I don't have any way of picking up incoming torpedoes outside of having the vigilance skill, which I don't have on the Jack Dunkirk captain. So now that it's just me and these two cruisers, I'm more than happy to take some of the attention, knowing I can heal back, and maybe um, allow the, uh, the Charles Martel a bit of freedom to, uh, to to do some damage as well. And this is this is a really good situation to be in in this ship when you're basically fronting for a couple of... Oh, oh, I completely meant to bash my desk there. When you're fronting for a couple of friendly cruisers and uh, facing off against enemy cruisers and you're just absorbing that HE damage knowing that you can get it back and giving your allied ships the space to work. So with the Chapayev down, there was a Nuremberg that's down as well, it just leaves the Pensacola, and then the Colorado gets spotted, but he's far too late to do anything to actually help his allies at this point. He's done some weird little circling around the islands on the 9 and 10 lines. And so, although we were kind of down at one point, we've now really reversed this situation and uh, brought it right back round in our favour. And this is a nice broadside Colorado as well. I know I'm very unlikely to get, uh, to get a, a Citadel, but I might still get some nice pens. 
I think it was that first replay where it was a, a broadside Colorado and was it like 17k from a single salvo without any citadels? So you, these guns can still perform against battleships, and especially if they're going to sail along very slowly broadside, it uh, makes it rather nice for you. There's also still just enough distance to, to give me time to react and wiggle the ship a bit and try and take things uh, as glancing blows on the belt versus uh, getting penned uh, through the uh, through the fore armor. But uh, there's obviously a, a fair bit of RNG involved with that, presuming that the uh, the other person is aiming well. And this Colorado doesn't seem to be aiming particularly well, so I'm really not that worried. I'd actually rather that they fire at me rather than that they be firing at my uh, two cruiser teammates, because the Martel and the New Orleans at this point don't have a lot of hit points left, and so if this guy gets lucky, he could probably just delete them. So I'd much rather take my chances and, and, and take his attention rather than, um, you know, gamble on him just missing my rather squashier teammates. That's another solid 10k. This guy is, at this point, uh, fairly burning down. I didn't have Adrenaline Rush. I, I don't have Adrenaline Rush on this captain. He's only up to, like, 12 captain points or something. I can't remember which uh, skill I'm saving for at this point. But um, Adrenaline Rush, I think, on the Nelson would actually be really useful because um, there are times when you can afford to let your hit points go down quite low. Or, well, maybe not. Maybe afford is the wrong word, but there are times when it will go down quite low, and so you might as well get the benefit of it before you hit the magic T key that heals half your ship somehow. So that's it for heals. That's it for the final ship. The Colorado uh, burned out and now there's just an aircraft carrier, which, well, no, actually that would be still a ship, wouldn't it? The final warship? Battleship? Battleship. Let's just pretend I said battleship to begin with. I did mention the cargo player didn't seem to be particularly good. Um, yeah, that's that's really why I kind of came to that opinion. Why they didn't just drop from the other side, I don't know. But um, they're basically about to do the same thing again, pretty much. I will take one of these. One of the back group has had sufficient time to arm, but the near side group, not so much. So, yeah, that was a bunch of torpedoes that just dinged off the hull for no damage because they didn't have time to arm. At least, to their credit, I guess they were trying to do manual drops. At least I think those were manual drops. I'm not entirely certain. I don't have a cargo myself. But uh, that was just far too close. No, it would have to be manual drops to drop that close, yes. So that's somebody that needs a little bit of practice in co-op more, maybe. And they did have two kills. So this wasn't a completely ineffective player. It's just when you see a, a carrier player making drops like that, uh, you can tell that maybe they're not the most experienced carrier player. So, completely did not lead enough for that, uh, that, that first salvo against the Kaga, now that we uh, have finally got them in sight. Uh, but RNG Jesus was kind to me and then clipped one of the shells in anyway. And then the third turret, uh, yeah, just completely straddled. But uh, I'm going to get at least one more chance to take some shots at this guy. So he's about to eat some torpedoes. And will my shots land before somebody else gets it? And there we go. I get the final kill. So nearly 97k damage, pretty respectable result, with uh, two kills, uh, not a lot of plane kills. Most of my AA got knocked out in that one. As I mentioned earlier on when I was talking about AA, uh, if you get subjected to a lot of HE spam, you're going to lose those 40 mils. And I think in this one, in fact, I lost all of the 40 mils, completely wiped out. They don't have a lot of hit points, those secondary modules. So... Uh, the fact that he messed up so badly with those drops at the end really saved my bacon. Although, there was a nice bit of teamwork going on in contrast to the previous replay as well. You know, the cruisers were trying to get closer to me to give me AA support, and people were generally working together quite nicely in that one. Whereas in the previous one, it, it felt that we more won despite people not working that closely together when we needed to. So all in all, I like the Nelson. I like it more than the Hood. I would recommend it as a premium tier 7 battleship more than the Hood. There is, however, that big downside of the cost. It's going to be 375,000 free XP. Obviously, that's considerably cheaper than the Missouri, 
which is at 750,000, but the Missouri costs what a tier 9 would cost. The Nelson costs something like what a tier 8 would cost, even though it's a tier 7. So it's over and above what it should be if, if Wargaming just um, made it purely the cost of a tier 7 battleship in terms of free XP. So it's not that cheap in those terms, and it then means that if you go and buy doubloons and convert all the free XP that you need, it's going to be quite expensive. It's going to be basically about the cost of a tier 8 premium. And I don't think it's worth that much. I honestly don't think it's worth that much. As a ship, however, you can grind out for completely free. It's not half bad. But doing it completely free without a premium account will probably take a while. If I had to guess, you know, if you're playing a moderate amount of warships, um, like six months maybe as a complete ballpark figure, like that's just a complete guesstimate. It might be longer, it might be quicker. With the premium account, it definitely won't take six months, but it will still maybe take you a little while. As to why is it this expensive? Well, um, I guess Wargaming just want to soak up some free XP. But the flip side of that is it's a ship that theoretically you don't have to pay any money for, and it's a premium. So it's hard to complain too much, but it's a little fly in the ointment. You know, the fly is definitely in the ointment. And in fact, that, that, that ointment is then also in a, a bowl of soup. So you've got a fly that's both in the ointment and in the soup at the same time. I, I, I don't know why I tried to do that, but anyway, it's too late. It's done now. I've said those words out loud and yeah. So, very lastly, we'll have a quick look at the armour. I mean, I've basically talked about the important bits already, um, but, you know, I might as well actually show you. It's typically what I do with these videos anyway. So, um, you've all over got this uh, 25 mil. You've got 32 for the torpedo bulges, but um, uh, it's the the 25 on the the fore and aft that's the problem and actually it's 32 on the deck i think i made a mistake earlier i think i said it was 25 on the deck as well but no it's 32 so that's fine so if we strip that away uh the turrets you'll notice are um it's it's a nice 406 mil on the the faces i did have turrets getting knocked out a little bit though and i think that's because the turret faces on these and british battleships generally they're reasonably flat so you might want to take that captain skill that gives you the was it minus 30 percent to having uh, things knocked out that might actually be a valuable one for british battleships generally because as an izumo uh that was a weird way to say it an izumo player of old uh, before they buffed turret hit points um yeah there was nothing more frustrating than having all of your turrets on the front of your ship just being constantly knocked out because that's where the shells would be landing and i hadn't had any turrets be permanently knocked out on the nelson but uh, theoretically it could certainly happen especially with this raised middle gun even though the uh, the barbette is still a respectable 356 mil so you've got the uh, 32 mil deck armor. Then we get to the actual citadel, which you can see is above the the, the waterline. So uh, where are we? So that's covered by that 32 mil. And then you've got the uh, the citadel belt with 356 behind it. Did I say it was 406 earlier? I think the 406 is the yeah. I think earlier in the video I might have said 406 for the belt, but it's uh, it's 356 there. And then you can see. 330 mil amidships and uh, to the rear but the real problem with this citadel is that it's, it's got these these flat ends and so th this is where the the overmatch citadel pens happen as you get shells coming in that just go through that 25 mil front and rear and straight into your uh, citadel armor and it's only the top that's uh, got really any amount of armor to it in fact at the rear it's actually worse uh, so showing your rear in this ship's not necessarily a good idea but sometimes you are just going to have to do it to, to make a getaway but overall you know you still would much rather be exposing like you know this rather than exposing this because this will get you deleted whereas this you might take a citadel or two but you're not 
unless you're incredibly unlucky, are going to get annihilated in quite the same way. So, um, yeah, rather than drag this out any further, because this has been a ridiculously long video, as I'm sure you've noticed, um, I'll wrap things up there. So this is this is the Nelson uh, for a free ship, absolutely, for full price, spending doubloons to convert all of the free XP needed. No, I would not say it's worth that. But if you're the kind of person that's got some free XP and maybe spends some doubloons to get themselves this thing, then, you know, at, at what level you feel that's worth it, that's, that's a matter for you as a consumer. But... Um, Paying a little bit of money for this ship, I, I feel, is, is worthwhile. It's not a bad ship at all. It's got its own peculiarities, but uh, overall, um, you know, if I had to recommend this over the hood, as I said, I would absolutely recommend this over the hood, because hood is just much more of a frustrating ship to play quite often, whereas Nelson uh, is quite satisfying. And that's a good thing for a premium vehicle to be. So that's that for that uh, first look at HMS Nelson. Hopefully you have found it useful and it has uh, helped inform your uh, choice as to whether to buy this thing or to save up your free XP or whatever, which is obviously the entire point of the video. Uh, if you have found it handy, you can uh, hit the, uh, the like button. You can leave any comments below. You can sub to my channel if you haven't already. And as always, stay tuned for more.